Yannick Ambrose, you co-wrote and directed one of the most unique films I've seen in years. It's called Mondo Hollywood Land, and it's now available to rent or own on Amazon. And uh, I'm going to go on a limb and say uh, it's available to own on Amazon because, damn. Uh, this is, you know, I, I said it's a unique movie, but it really is about kind of everything. It's a fifth dimensional traveler who winds up in Hollywood uh, following a mushrooms dealer around town uh, and kind of trying to figure out the secret of what is Mondo. Now, that could mean a lot of things, and uh, it's certainly a journey for the audience to, uh, <laughs> to go on. But I want to start at the very beginning. Who are you? How did you get into this crazy business uh, and end up making a movie about possibly the ultimate movie about this crazy business called entertainment? Um, yeah, so, um, you know, I wanted to, I'm one of those kind of uh, people who was making like home video movies when I was really young. So like, you know, seven, eight, just like playing around, like stop motion, all that kind of stuff, right? But ultimately, it was like when I was a teenager, when I was really getting into movies, just kind of, I had like one summer where I just like hit all of the kind of typical, like good movies, you know, like Lawrence of Arabia, like just like, just like, just these kind of like massive lists of movies. And then, uh, so I kind of knew I wanted to do that. Um, my cousins uh, were pretty instrumental in this because they gave me like a list. This is when I was really young of like Goodfellas, a lot of Scorsese films, a lot of gangster films, like uh, Menace to Society, Juice, like a lot of these like cool, like just, you know, just awesome movies. So yeah, so I kind of started just know, I kind of knew I wanted to do film, but it was always this kind of like, like, I don't know, this little bit of this like, yeah, probably some people saw it as like some weird, like, oh, Yannick has some weird pipe dream about, you know, going to Hollywood and making movies. And I was, an, I was, I was a, grew up in Albany, New York. So I kind of learned, though, through just my surroundings that, like, money makes the world go around. <laughs> so I kind of went into, uh, I didn't go to film school for undergrad. I, I, I kind of, like, didn't get the best grades because I was mostly just like screwing around watching movies and stuff like that. But I went to school and got a degree in economics. So I did like finance for a bit, but always with the kind of knowledge knowing that, oh, this is kind of my roundabout way to like get into movies. I don't know. I was like, I was like, I'll figure it out somehow. So I eventually did move out there with kind of the, some of the economic finance background. And that kind of uh, helped me create my own company when I was right when I, right when I moved to LA when I was like 22, which is the company I have now, which also does financing and stuff. So that was kind of my way in. I kind of was like, okay, well, I'll start a company and then kind of like put myself in charge of making movies. And it kind of, to some degree, it, it obviously it, it's it worked in some levels. But like, yeah, so that's kind of how I did it. Is like it was just more like I always knew I wanted to do it but I studied different things. I kind of also figured if I studied different, like history, economics, politics, because most of my films are all very, very political and I'm just like entrenched in politics and all that kind of stuff. And my first film was a, a documentary on the war on terror. Um, a lot of my early, early, more experimental shorts were more political. The stuff I executive produce is usually political. So I, I learned a lot about things that I can make movies about and then kind of got into it that way and then of course this movie is like very much about the Hollywood or whatever but like yeah so that was kind of my roundabout way to getting into the film industry so when did you move out to LA when what timeline was that was 2012 2012 so you didn't have a plan when you moved out to LA you just kind of went out there with an economics degree and set up shop uh this was, you know, right as the economy was not doing great so this is kind of a, a doubly bold move yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't know anybody there. So that was like interesting. So that was like, uh, but I like, it was like the Willie Loman with like death of a salesman. I would just cold call people and shit. You know, it was, it was nuts. Like it, I really like, I, I was actually met, met with a producer yesterday just for like drinks. And uh, it was just funny talking about like, I think I've, I think I emailed him when I was like 22, like, hi, my name is Yannick. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing, but like, uh, maybe you can like, so like, it's funny. I can, I talk to people now, like people at like CAA or whatever, and I'll like, 
I'll be like, oh shit, I probably emailed them when I was like 23, like pitching them some random shitty screenplay I wrote. <laughs> so I'll like, I'll always go back and look and like see if I emailed this person 10 years ago. But yeah, so I kind of just like cold called people and like emailed blasted people and just try to like claw my way in that way. So how did that, well, I know how it would work, but how did it work? How effective was it as far as getting people to even talk to you or did you just get kind of ghosted or did people give you advice? Like, how did that work out? Oh, it was cool. Like, uh, there's a great, uh, you know, Br- uh, Brian Grazer, the producer. Yeah. yeah. Um, Ron Howard's partner, right? Yeah. He produced, the, uh, actually produced, he, he wrote a book called A Curious Mind. I actually didn't learn about the book till later, but it was kind of reinforced some of what I did. So what I did, what his book is basically is, is like, he got an office at Paramount when he was young and he used that office to be like, Hey, uh, I need like five minutes of your time. And he just did that for years. And he cultivated a lot of relationships that way, though. He says it was like more of like, there wasn't any like the ulterior motive to like, but I don't know, <laughs> but like he would reach out to people in the industry to like talk to them and cultivate relationships. I did like similar. I like one example, which is like kind of funny. And like my, my hero has always been Coppola because he was kind of half, director half kind of this business guy you know whatever because he'd be this big producer and of course he's like the greatest director ever right one of the best right so i he, his, his uh lawyers uh this, this guy barry hirsch and uh it's funny he's actually mentioned in uh you know the hearts of darkness documentary yeah yeah well in one scene coppola is like screaming about martin sheeny and he mentions barry hirsch's name so it's like i was always, so i when i was really young i emailed him a lot and i would be like i really probably really annoying i was like hey do you have like can I talk to Mr. Coppola? <laughs> and he was like, no, like, leave me alone. Like, he's like a you know, high powered lawyer. He's like, what the fuck is this? But eventually he like put me in contact with his assistant. And then eventually I got to talk to Coppola for like, like two hours on the phone. Wow. So like, it's, so like, it was effective in that way. I got a lot of advice. There's a lot of advice actually I used for this film. Like, uh, but also there was some really people that it, it turned into like actual material, like, like uh collaborations like barbara defina is you know martin scorsese's producer for 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 years she produced goodfellas casino and that was one person i reached out to after i made something though i would make these little films for like very little money and then i would reach out to them and say hey do you like this because i i felt like if i reached out to some of these people without having anything it would be just like what do you want me to do (laughs) (laughs) so so like it was it was actually really effective and people i think are very, you just have to be, I think if anybody were to think about doing this, if someone's watching this, like trying, like, it's just about personalizing it, not being full of shit, like really reaching out to people that like did inspire you and kind of like a, a focus on what you would, you know, compliment them on or, 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 or what you essentially, what kind of want from them. It's like, it's just more authentic. And then I think people will eventually kind of respond, literally respond back and, you know, maybe you can build relationships that way. So I think it was kind of effective. Well, I mean, that's encouraging, I imagine, because you hear about Hollywood, you hear, you know, one of two things, the the rich and famous, you know, they, they talk about making movies and everybody's a family and it's all great. And then you hear about the people who come from a bus on, you know, come on a bus from Idaho and they just end up never making it because everybody's cruel and, and selfish and out for themselves. It sounds like you've had, you know, kind of a, a dream experience. I mean, I imagine not all the interactions were, were that positive and magical oh, yeah, getting I mean, to talk like, to Coppola. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of just obviously people who didn't respond. Especially, I think people were a little bit more rude back then too. I think people are a little more careful these days to kind of just be like, you know, like email, email I would email like agents. They'd be like, fuck off. Like, you know, you don't see that as think as much anymore. But no, look, I don't want to be like, oh, I, I came out here because like, there's nothing more annoying than like when somebody's like, oh, I moved to Hollywood and started with nothing. Like, I didn't start from, any, from nothing. I had a degree, you know, like I was very fortunate to kind of, you know, so it's like, I, you know, I think I think I had a lot of things kind of go my way um, in terms of like that aspect of it. So I don't know. So. So kind of curious, what did your economics degree, aside from, you know, helping to set up a company, I imagine, and, you know, be smart with the money, you know, once it started coming in, uh, what did you learn? Well, hopefully, <laughs> what yeah, did you learn? I'm still learning in, a lot of that, yeah. <laughs> well, but like going through that program and getting your degree, did that help you at all for dealing with Hollywood? Yeah, I think it made me a little bit more like cynic, like cynical about what 
bottom line me- it was for like how to make a movie. Why would anybody make a movie that this is ultimately a business? Um, I think that's an important thing to kind of have in the back of your mind as you're trying to make something that's outside the box. Even if you're trying to make something totally crazy and psychedelic or like really politically edgy, it's just kind of having that at least in the back of your mind that, you know, not like doing it just for that, like serving that industrial kind of like thing that this business is, but just having it in the back of your mind. So when you speak to somebody, it's a little bit more like you're able to like, maybe get a little bit of money or, 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 or do it like that. So, I mean, now I've kind of veered a little bit more into like film finance and stuff, but back when I was originally starting, it was, it was very helpful. And then like my first, one of my first movies is like a short film. It was about the 08, uh, um, about the two, or like about the housing crisis, and it was about like a Wall Street broker kind of go dissecting every single economic thing through his like in his head with a few minutes left till like the the market closed on one of those days where like Lehman Brothers was collapsing. Yeah, this was like in 2012 I made it, and like so literally like the um, the actual substance of what I learned in economics is is something I use too. It's it, it's not just the, the the business. Like I've been developing a movie. Um, about FDR Secretary of Labor, more of a bigger budget thing that I would probably just be a writer on and, and dish off to maybe some of them who's a little bit more of a veteran director. So that like, I use a lot of economics and politics in, in the work. So it's not just like, oh, how can it help me make the business? It's like, it's like material, you know, it's like doing research. Cause people say like, oh, write, write what you know. But it's like, I think that can be sometimes a little bit like dangerous. Cause it's like, you should try to expand your mind and learn about other things because otherwise you just have a bunch of movies that are about like couples in Brooklyn or Silver Lake. You know what I mean? And it's just <laughs> yeah. like, fuck, Jesus Christ. So like, I think you should challenge yourself to really learn and read and, and, uh, and educate yourself on stuff that's interesting or unique so you can implement it into your work, you know? So you both learn others' life experiences that that's not your own. Like that's really important, you know, and I think especially for film, that's like a medium about like the empathy machine that, you know, Ebert talks about, you know? Yeah. Now you mentioned that you got your, your degree in economics. Did you end up going to film school? Did you study film while you're in, you know, school, any kind of a program or. Yeah. So, so I kind of did this like a more of a conservatory while I started my company. Um, And that was like helpful it was like yeah it was good it was like i had some really good teachers there who kind of worked in the business and stuff like that so that was that was really helpful there is an acting class segment uh in the dreamers chapter of mondo hollywood land uh i wonder now acting and directing are two different you know disciplines especially when you're learning but uh was any of the the class material in the movie uh, drawn from your experience in class? Did you have any crazy angry teachers? No, that was actually, so uh, uh, Blim, you know, the producer, co-writer, star, production designer who really made this movie with me um, through and through. He was, uh, that was, I think, I don't want to speak for him, but that means that's something he uh, really wrote. And uh, I, I think not only, I, yeah, I'm pretty sure the teacher is the teacher so he flew in the teacher that he had to play that guy, which was probably, yeah, it was pretty wild. I, I don't know if it's like based off what he was like in real life, but that would be something for more uh, for Chris to answer because that was like he focused on. But yeah, I think uh, he, he was, he went to school, I think for, for uh, more acting and theater. So that wasn't, no, I, I, I only took a few, I took a few acting classes when I was in LA and they were, yeah, they really scared me. I, I wasn't a fan. There's a lot of like, you know, like, like the first second you go in, it's like, okay, now like start dancing. And I was like, I have to go, <laughs> you know, like, I'm not, I think I could do that now and not feel too weird. But I remember I went with this, uh, this uh, actor who I produced a movie with um, and she was like, you should come. And I was, it was just horrifying to me. I don't know. It was scary. So let's talk a bit about the uh, the collaboration that went into making Mono Hollywood Land. You mentioned, um, you know, Chris Blim, uh, and there was another, uh, there was a third writer on the movie. Um, yeah, Marcus. Marcus Hart, yeah. Uh, so what, how did you collaborate to make this picture? It sounds like, from what you were saying, Chris brought more of an autobiographical tinge to that acting portion. Did you kind of divvy up the three main sections and then someone no, wrote the no, bookends think- or... Yeah, no, I would, I would say like 
that wouldn't be like uh like yeah that was something he worked on like we worked in the whole the whole thing so i kind of how it all started i'll, I'll kind of maybe get into that it's like so me and marcus this is like 2014 we uh, uh, marcus is a huge paul thomas anderson fan like you know it's huge right Ever, who isn't but like he's more than normal <laughs> and he was like there is a uh, screening of mondo hollywood which is the 1967 film or some weird film that paul thomas anderson is presenting so uh i i basically uh me and him went to the screening though there's this kind of a side story that i'm not going to fully get into where i kind of missed the screening but <laughs> whatever it's a, maybe a different story for a different day so anyway so he Paul Thomas Anderson presented this film, played it. I later watched it on YouTube because I didn't go to the screening. And then uh, I, we were like, oh, I, I, it was like, what a cool, like crazy psychedelic film. So I was like, oh, what if we did a VR version of like Hollywood? And we did this like, because I got this VR camera and that was like a new thing. And I was like into it. But after a while, I was like, this isn't like a filmmaker. This isn't like, a, this isn't movies. Like, this is a different thing. Like, VR is just a different thing than movies. It's cool. I love it. I, there's a lot of artistry in it. I know people who are into it, but not my thing. So, at first, it was just more like documentary thing. And it was kind of like, I don't know. I didn't really, it was just kind of this narration that goes over like more of a cinema verite thing. Kind of more like the original one. But the original one was so great. And this one was trying to maybe, I don't know, it just wasn't working. So I met Chris and I was like, hey, I kind of am like half working this, trying to make this movie thing, but it's like, like, what if we made it a narrative together? So, and then Chris came on board and kind of the, the trio was made. And then we went for a way more narrative style. And so, and, and Blim is very like creative and imaginative and like, and just like uh, able to really kind of, do abstracts and like is very goofy and funny so that's when we all kind of like were able to like hash out the framework of the screenplay and then you know Chris and I would kind of work on like the comedy stuff and like do like the kind of vignettes and then we kind of just wrote all the way up until the end of the edit like the script would always be changing uh it was a wild process with, the, with that it sounds like it I mean I didn't quite know what to expect. You know, I, I put the movie on. It's, it is very, um, you know, uh, I guess montage driven in the beginning um, with, you don't, you're not quite, it's, it's hard to get oriented uh, in the film. Um, there's a lot of bright colors and random scenery, uh, a lot of uh, footage that I didn't expect to see. Like you've got um, some shots from like Godfather and, and Raiders of the Lost Ark. And my first question uh, in my head while I was watching was how'd you get the rights to have that or is that sort of a uh, <laughs> something is snuck fair use it's fair use really yeah a lot of so like uh, my first uh movie imminent threat was a doc on the war on terror and I didn't have any money so I uh I interviewed like six people and then interspliced it with just rip stuff off YouTube of like stock footage CNN footage interviews and then you just, uh, I put it together and I was like, well, I don't know if anybody can watch it. And then uh, a fair use lawyer was like, yeah, you can, as long as you're saying something, like there's a lot, of, there's, a, there's, there's legal uh, basis for being able to express and, 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 um, and say things with fair use. I'm going to get too much into it, but I guess yeah, so a lot of, a lot of that stuff is just like, like if, if something's happening and you're not portraying it in a, in a wrong way then it's like you're fine to use it like it's like a car or something like if you're just driving a car then like you're you you're, you're you'll be fine to use it it's if you like can if you like twist it into something else and portray that thing in a bad way you know what i mean i guess that makes sense because in the context and and they're very quick shots but uh the you're sort of discussing the history of hollywood and, and showing you know showcasing a couple of hollywood movies exactly you have to kind of be yes yeah, sorry to interrupt but you have that's exactly the thing you have to like it has to be like um in tandem with a point yeah well it, it, we see the same thing kind of on youtube as well you know you can't just you know repost a trailer for a marvel movie if you want to do that you can talk about it you can kind of give it some extra context so you kind of like reporting on it yeah um no that's that that's cool but what I was getting at was 
once the movie kind of settles in after the first you know few minutes and we get into this narrative conceit of the fifth dimensional traveler talking to um you know uh, Boyle, the mushroom dealer played by by chris blim uh Boyle asserts that there are th sort of three tiers uh, in this weird landscape of titans, weirdos, and dreamers. And then we go into these three sort of stories that become interconnected throughout the film. What struck me, particularly towards the, the last uh, section with the dreamers, um, and I should say there's sort of a fourth part where every, everything really does come together into this bizarre sort of heist, which I won't really get into. Uh, but the there's a, an audacity and a savage you know pointed humor that frankly you just don't see much anymore because i don't think people have enough <laughs> balls in the entertainment industry to make these kinds of jokes but then towards that third section uh with the weirdos there's some real poignancy and emotion and drama going on there that does you know rebound a little bit of comedy but this your film really does encapsulate everything about the magic of movies from the po the visual possibilities to the absurdity to the ability to draw out uh you know the whole range of emotions i just wondered was that something that was on the page or you kind of mentioned you were working on this up until it was sort of uh done did you was that an intention or was it something you kind of found in the edit as you went along i mean i think everything it was funny like i i i reread the scripts because like marcus would be kind of our script he would be kind of the the our our like ba like home base for the script sometimes you know blim and i would be going off and producing a film but sometimes we'd be like wait what <laughs> you know we have to go back to marcus and he'd be like hey structure this is actually it's like underneath the film there's a structure it looks like chaos but like and it is but like there's buried structure underneath because otherwise it really wouldn't work at all like there has structures everything in film right so to answer your question yeah it was on the page but sometimes it would like we would just veer off from the page but it, like the core of it like the kind of like like the, the 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 like the the essence of it was kind of on the page always like but we would always veer off from that as far like go on crazy tangents but always try to keep it a little bit contained but yeah i don't to answer your i'm not exactly sure like you mean like the um the the try like the range of like emotions and like the range of like like uh like feelings you might el get elicit for like from an off audience was that like intentionally you're saying? Yeah, I mean it's almost like uh you know as you go down these tiers from the titans it, it seems kind of ran random at the outset but you realize by the end of the film there are certain tiers almost like going through down through Dante's levels of hell but almost in reverse we were going down from uh more of a an abstract callousness of the business down to the point where you get to the dreamers who are the people who really come to Hollywood who want to make something of themselves uh, and still maintain their humanity on their way to uh, achieving their dreams. So the Titans are, you know, you've got your, your kind of movie executive, Ted, who's having troubles with uh, the young former Disney princess and her new Twilight and space movie. Uh, they get in down into the uh, the weirdos, which is, uh, you know, this this one character is trying to organize a basically a political get together of people of all different uh, persuasions having a dialogue and how hard that is. But then you get down into the dreamers. And um, I believe it was Anna was the character uh, who was, you know, she's an aspiring actress. You know, her grandmother, I think, was uh, had achieved some notoriety, but never quite made it. And then you've got Barry, uh, who's the personal fitness instructor, wants to open a gym. In those stories, you really get a sense of these are, you know, people who have not yet been broken by Hollywood. Uh, they are unlike Ted, who we met at the very beginning. So you're kind of coming full circle. You see the people who've lost their humanity. That's where you start. And you end with people who uh, still have that, even though they've been struggling. They never quite yeah, got yeah, enveloped that... by the beast. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, I think um, the weirdo section is always like, cause I, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, I'm really into, you know, into doing stuff about politics. That was definitely the most fun, like for me, just because, you know, I think uh, the, the Hollywood and Hollywood stuff I, I love, but like, it was really fun to do the Antifa stuff. I mean, that's obviously kind of the, kind of the secret of the movie, I think of really what it ends up being kind of like about in many ways with my, you know with my character and stuff like that of like um kind of what the twist is on on, on that but 
and just like the the character you mentioned naya was trying to create this like political revolution through talking while the other character uh daphne is trying to do political movement through like blowing shit up so it's like kind of the both like two way different spectrums right uh but yeah the dreamer section is way more of this kind of like you know like i don't want to say it's like charming but also like scary because it's 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 not working for the characters but they're like and that's where you know some of the more like influences of like death of salesman come i mentioned that earlier but it's like where you just kind of are so you're tr you know someone like barry who's just consistent on trying to do this thing that's clearly not working but it's he's just holding on to it so yeah it's it's, it's all like i think i don't think i had any we i don't think any of us had this like this hyper specific um intention of like how the three kind of the timeline of the three exactly it was more of just making sure that those three existed and that they kind of came together i don't know that's the best way to say it um one thing i want to ask uh i don't want to spoil who i'm talking about so i'll just tiptoe around it there is a framed picture that becomes very important of you and a sort of notorious political figure I yeah. couldn't tell if that was real or if that was one of the best Photoshop jobs I've seen in a movie in a while. Polit uh, Politicon. So you did meet him. Yeah. Wow. So was it? Uh, was that just for? Was, well, <laughs> was that so just like I'm? I've got, I'm working on a screenplay, you know, in your head, and they're like, "Hey, can I get a picture?" Well, so I used to have these. Uh, my first few films were these like anti-war docs, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of like, uh, and this was like a, during like 2013, 2014. So there's like a, like a lot of libertarians who are kind of jumping on the like, you know, mostly caring about like tax policies, right? But like they would also be pretty good on, you know, despite their horrible economic and policies, just, you know, They'd be pretty good on 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 um, anti-war stuff, right? There, that's like one area that you, there's like some common ground with like the left, and so I would go to some of these conferences and stuff, and I always wondered. I was like, well, some of those people there have nothing to do with anti-war movement, and they're more like you know like anti-tax people, like Robert Norquist and shit. And it was funny because I'd meet them, and I would be like, you know, one day I'm kind of here. They kind of just think I'm. I was like, one day maybe I can do some sort of like Borat kind of interview thing so when i when i uh when i was at politicon it was you know i, I just like attended because i liked I, I remember i i wanted to see somebody's i forget but so yeah i i i did see this person and i always take the opportunity i think i even like ann coulter was there and i try to give it's like so i always try to take the opportunity to kind of do something like that because i know with the weird stuff i make i might need it so I don't think there was anything, I don't think I knew, I think I was making motto then. And I was like, but I don't know if that was the intention, but I always try to do that. And hopefully, you know, one was, now I'm like giving the gamut away, but it's like, I, I do want to do some sort of like uh, maybe fake interview with, with some of one of these political figures to kind of do something goofy with. I don't know, but um, hopefully they're not watching this. You got used to <laughs> you it all off for me, man. <laughs> well, I, I haven't mentioned, you know, who no, no, we're no, talking about okay, specifically. Okay, yeah. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I do want to talk about the uh, the Antifa stuff. That was a very because this this film was all shot pre pandemic. Is that right? Oh yeah. So this uh, this this was shot in like twenty eighteen. So when we were actually screening the movie in twenty nineteen for people, people were like, "Hey, I don't know who these people are. I don't know what Antifa is," and so that was a big problem because it was like. You know, you can kind of just be like, oh, they're communists or whatever, or like, but no, it was like really important for the audience to like know what Antifa was. So I was like, I don't know. But and then by the time we, by the time we fucking just with everything that happened, I mean, obviously everybody knows who Antifa is. Probably as we speak, Fox News is like freaking out, like salivating at the mouth about how like Antifa is joining the forces with Taliban or some <laughs> crazy nonsense. You know what I mean? So like. I know. So like, yeah, so when we first did it, not a lot of people knew who they were. And then just through external, you know, political forces and all that, like it obviously is now a, a huge thing, you know? So it was just funny how that worked out. Now everybody knows obviously what that is. It's weird because 
with, again, without giving much away, they don't come off well uh, in the film. So I'm just wondering, do you know, <laughs> was there any kind of fear once this thing was in the can and, and you knew when it was going to be coming out that uh, they might ruffle some feathers? No, because ultimately, I don't want to give it away, but like, ultimately, Daphne's like the true one, right? Because obviously one of them is, you know, not even really in Tifa. Mm -hmm. And then the other guy is based off, because I used to go to like Occupy LA rallies. And that, so that wasn't in Tifa, but that was probably some like an in part of the origin of some of that, of that left movement. Um, so I remember going to some of those and look, I mean, I think the movie's a comedy, right? So I love, um, actors and I love these people and they're kind of making, poking fun at them. So it was never really an intent. I mean, it's a comedy, right? Yeah. So, but the, but the values and the cores of like what, what they're actually trying to do is becomes a huge important part of the movie in the third act. And the characters kind of, you know, rally around a certain character in the in, in the weirdo chapter. Where so I don't know. I think if piece, if I think if somebody fully watched the movie, they wouldn't have that perception. I think they would, unless they're very sensitive to like any kind of joke, which you know, I guess maybe some of them are. But no, I think ultimately the movie's like it's not really throwing. At the end of the day, this is like gets into the whole thing about it, Antifa and stuff. But like at the end of the day, it's like the movie does deal with an actual like fascist, right? Like like uh, a character who's who's that, and ultimately it is against that character. Yeah. So like the splitting of the hairs of like what Antifa is and stuff like that, I don't know. But yeah, it's obviously making kind of light of maybe of like of of like so like here's an example. One reason why I thought that was interesting to do was because on the news, at least now, you you would think that Antifa was like a organized, like if you watch like Fox, you'd think Antifa is some like highly organized, sophisticated like organization, like, you know, all these things where it's, it's not, it's, it's literally, a, it's a, like, it's like a, it's like a movement of young people who are, you know, angry about certain things, right? So showing them in that light is, is, to, is kind of mitigating this irrational, crazy fear that people have of Antifa and like all that stuff. So I think that was part of the attention, but no, it definitely wasn't like to make total fun of them. You know what I mean? Well, I mean, it's that's the thing is there was like in, you know, that, hmm. Yeah, you're you're correct. Because of the way that whole storyline plays out, and because a character is who he is, it does make sense that they would be kind of goofy and and, <laughs> and a little bit sad in terms of how like one of those particular meetings went. Um, but uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you, and I kind of touched on this, there's some some of the humor in the earlier portions of the film. You know, some of these these jokes felt like they were. This is not to say that they're dated. It's just that I haven't seen an audacity in some of this humor since like 2013. The things that people are kind of getting in trouble for now. Uh, there's a 9-11 a joke that you might, my jaw hit the floor. You know, it, it was a funny joke. But again, did you have any fear of putting some of this, you know, out there? You know, they're, they're talking about, you know, everything from, you know, cultural and political identities to like racial identities to all that stuff or you just was there any thought that eh, we can't really say this stuff right, right now no because look i think ultimately i think uh if i'm pretty comfortable with what how what i think politically and like what i think about you know a, a wide span of issues where i'm, I'm not like I, I just i just i don't feel like uh, i feel like some of that if it, it, it depends what kind of like what your ultimate like worldview and intentions are right i think that's when actually people can smell something that's a little bit wrong right a funny joke in the context of a movie that's i to me ultimately about kind of weeding out some you know bad actors in, in town right like maybe like the, the character in the movie that the villain of the movie ultimately i think the movie has a very positive message about you know kind of working as a collective but with amongst a lot of individuals all these kind of things that like I, I i i can stand behind in the film as a whole so i think as long as you stand behind the whole canvas it's okay you know to make some jokes i think that's kind of a little bit in some weird ways overblown 
I think people were like, I mean, it, like people like, oh, cancel culture. You can't do anything these days. You can't go and do stand up. Like, yeah, you can. I well, I mean, there there is some of that. I mean, we have seen For some sure. repercussions. Sure. It's it it all it. The, I think the problem is it's very situational. You know, sometimes people can say stuff that's outrageous and and no one cares, and other times, you know, I think that it's the randomness that kind of puts people off. Um, yeah, no, but I definitely was conscious of these things, and I and, and like I think actually to go to your to some of your uh, this might be a good like way to talk this too is like I think some of the older mondo films which maybe i don't like do service to enough is like they really intended to do shock and like offend people where that to me wasn't really my in, like interest or intention at all frankly there's like people joke it's like uh when they see the movie they're like oh your movie's surprisingly wholesome you know what i mean it's like <laughs> i well i i think i think that's and fair it, it, and it's you know. a detriment. It's, a, it's in some ways to some people who are really into those genre of films. I think they're a little bit like, oh, it's kind of almost not like crass. But like, I, I didn't really have an interest in doing these kind of like, you know, you know, like like I love Roger Corman and stuff. But it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to get like the girls and like that's when I think it kind of gets a little bit like, what is this? And I don't think that would hold up well at all. And I wouldn't really want to make that. But the stuff we're doing, I think, is a little bit more like, you know, it's a little bit more just like poking fun at the world as opposed to trying to offend a certain group of people and being like, Oh, we got away with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Unless, I, unless of course, if you're like in the alt right and you get offended, but that's like, I don't care. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's wholesome. I think is it's, it's an odd term to apply to this movie. But I think it, I think it works, especially. <laughs> yeah, it's a weird, it is weird. <laughs> Well, because you look at the wholesome cocaine use, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but just in terms of you know the message of in that what I'll call the fourth act, because you've got this you know it's not quite the bookend, it's not quite the three main sections. It's how the three main parts all come together and the characters come together to accomplish something. These are folks who you know they shouldn't really meld. You've got the <laughs> the Antifa you know member and the the studio executive working together to solve a problem along with the uh, the shrooms dealer dealer and uh, and other folks and the actress. But it just it does show that uh, people despite their their differences and their backgrounds they can come together to <laughs> take down the villain. Yeah and I, I think uh, I think one thing Blim and I would always say is like oh it take it takes a village kind of thing, right? It takes a village to take down this villain. And that was something I just always, uh, and you know, it's like part of the reason why I play that character. I remember I was, I think it was Blim's idea, but it was like, I remember I'd be like, who's gonna wanna play this fucking character, you know? And so it was like, oh, I'm like, I don't know. So yeah, but that that's definitely, uh, no, that's a big part of like what, you know, I can only speak for myself on the film, right? Cause I, I everybody, involved in the film especially like blim and marcus or wrote it with me like they have i'm sure their own way of looking at things but to me i think part of the reason why i uh, what i want people to to get out of it or like if they get something out of it other than just maybe a laugh or being like what the fuck or what, what kind of what is this is like there are these kind of like, like bad actors even especially nowadays where there's like the internet is kind of like you know really given um an opportunity for kind of these people to really get their ideas out there is like is like uh yeah it's, they're not they're you know like it's the end of the movie like the, it's not uh it's not cool <laughs> like, you know what i mean like and no i really i mean it's like it hits, it hits a younger audience or something like that and like being able to take jabs at like some of those types of people the kind of uh you know like the bench of bureaus of the world and stuff like uh i think better for it you know well um i do want to ask you know, James Cromwell is listed as an executive producer on the movie. How did you get him involved or how, how was he involved? So it kind of goes back to our original conversation because back in, um, in 2015, I, I directed that, uh, movie, uh, imminent threat. Uh, and I basically was reaching out. I reached out to like Oliver Stone and he was coming out with Snowden, so he was like, I, I don't know if that was the reason, but that's what he said at least. He might have just not liked it, but like, <laughs> but Cromwell watched it and he liked it, and he responded. His uh, his his um, colleague responded and was like, Yeah, he'd love to put his name on it. So that was years ago. So this time around, I didn't think. I think I might have even like annoyed him with like a 
with some other movie and he like they never responded so i was like oh maybe i like screwed up my relationship with james cromwell shit so i didn't like reach out to him up until the very end where i said hey i made this movie you know me, me and my friends made this movie would you want to put your name on it to help and he watched it and he was really into it and he's been kind of like doing interviews and he's really helpful and he's just the best i mean not just like a really like great you know um oscar nominated actor but like uh he's a real activist he's a real progressive doing really great stuff you know so he's just a really cool person to just be associated with honestly like he's he's the man like he's he's a really cool dude nice um now as far as the actual filming of the movie uh when i first got when you first reached out to me you said that you shot this for like 10 grand and on a phone now is that an exaggeration <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we've eventually uh, obviously needed a little bit more money for um, like releasing the movie, you know, like, um, uh, like, like we did it like, yeah, like publicity, you know, like, like the extra things later. So sure. it probably ended up being a little bit more like, like, if you included everything, which usually film budgets, you don't include a lot of the like, more release oriented stuff. It's mostly just the production budget. Yeah, it was, it was, um, like there wasn't really a crew. It was mostly Chris and I. So there wasn't like a gaffer, a best boy or truck outside. It was just backpack, Chris, me. And then a few times we had uh, the Air, uh, Aaron who played uh, Caesar. He's a great actor, but he also just is also knowledgeable about sound. So a few days he did sound, but no, it was really just backpack with sound stuff and Blim would do it basically. So Blim was the production designer and I was shooting. So that's kind of how we did it is it was just Blim and I, and I, you know, and that's, the more I think about it, the more crazy it is. Cause it's like, you know, you just, usually you have a crew of people working on the movie, but it just, it just wasn't that case. Yeah. What phone did you use? Or, or iPhone, it was an iPhone. Uh, I wish I had such a, it, it's, it's uh, iPhone eight uh, plus. Wow. Because it doesn't, you know, I don't know much about movies that are shot on phones, but I mean, it looks amazing um you know down to part of that maybe because there's such a variety of locations and and people and and just you know setting your camera on interesting things but uh, you know to say that you didn't have like a full lighting rig or you know a sophisticated sound rig or anything that's really surprising to me uh you know some of this i imagine was taken care of in in post like the different processing and effects of, of some of the scenes but uh, as far as the raw material you captured i mean it looked like it looked really professionally done well, I, I think a lot of that goes, uh, is uh, is the collaboration of Blim and I and Blim's ability to kind of find uh, always different color lighting and stuff like that. So Blim was really good at that. And something that kind of was, I, I, I'm not good with lighting. And it, so he was able to really get the kind of like red and blues and the purples and all that stuff like that in the movie. And then... Um, and so not even that much was done for, for, for color correction. So yeah, we, we, it was, it was interesting. I always like freak out when I see, cause it's like, I'm so now it's like, I need to have like focus and like, I, I just, cause it's, we didn't even use lenses on it. It's literally just zoom, like just the phone. So it, it'll probably be disorienting for some people to kind of be like, but maybe not, maybe so many people, especially younger people are used to watching content on, you know, like, TikTok, so I don't know. I mean, but but like, it definitely feels a little bit, even when I watch it, like just like bizarre because it's like, oh, this is a cell phone. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's it's amazing how far the technology has come. I mean, to think that you could make this movie, you know, you couldn't have made this movie really ten years ago when you first when you first got out here. Um, but yeah. uh, so let me ask, what what's next? What are you working on? Uh, what are you up to now? Um. Yeah, so this is, you know, just released. Um, I have another movie that came out, like, on March, I think, 15th of 2020. So that was, like, the worst time ever for anything to come out. And that was a anthology of shorts I did. So I'm trying to kind of put re, uh, re, re, like, kind of push that again just because it didn't, you know, it was, like, really bad timing. Um, but, no, I have a movie uh, called Hey Johnny that I'm uh, – for, that I'm uh, directing. That'll be my next directing movie because I, I write and produce uh, separately from directing. But for directing, uh, Hey Johnny, and that's kind of about this like showbiz, uh, small time showbiz uh, manager and this kind of like down on his luck, like, you know, 
gambling degenerate. It's like, it's like, but it's way different. It's way more of a character piece, like, you know, more traditional, uh, more of a actual, you know, more of a budget, you know, that kind of thing. So I, and that's kind of what I usually, I write, I usually write much more like, I mean, I would have some people would even say too formulaic type of stuff with the way I write screenplay. So it'll be interesting to see like doing that, doing that as opposed to something like this, that was so freewheeling and stuff, you know? So now that you've, you know, finished, you've gotten Mondo Hollywood land out of your system. Uh, do you feel differently about Hollywood now than you did when you started the film? Uh, yeah, just because I, I started it so long, you know, we started making this Glenn Marcus and I like so long ago. So it's like, I wouldn't say anything really from the film or I'm sure there is, but like, yeah, I mean, especially just the idea of like getting a feature, a low, lower budget feature out there. Like I did with my first film, but that was a documentary. Documentaries are different, you know, like a narrative film is just a whole different beast. So yeah, I, I, don't, even, I don't even know exactly what to put my finger on with that, but yeah, I mean, it's just, it's a while. It, it's just that it takes a long time. Movies take forever. And it's so, that's why so many movies, like, and there's so many steps, right? Because it's like, you make the movie and then you got to actually like finish the movie and then you have to like get the distributor and then you actually have to like release the movie. It's just, it's a five year process. And it's like, you know, and you just kind of hope it works. <laughs> but like, <laughs> but yeah, so, so I guess I learned just like, I mean, it just takes a long time, you know? And it's, it's pretty exhausting, but you know, it's, it's fun, you know? It's like a... That's what it's all about, I guess, right? So are you a titan, a weirdo, or a dreamer? Or a little bit of everything? Well, probably a little bit of everything. Um, but yeah, def definitely definitely a little bit of everything. <laughs> Excellent. Well, congratulations on, on the film. Like, like I said, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun to watch. Um, I love the, the ideas. I love the execution. I love that I had no idea what I was in for even as I was watching it, you know, all the way up to the very end. So congratulations again. Uh, I can't wait to see what you come up with next, man. And I really appreciate you talking to me. Yeah, absolutely, man. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know, uh, you know, these indie films are, they're, you know, this isn't out in every theater. So I know I appreciate you taking the time to, to spend some time on a, a small film like this. Yeah. All right, man. Well, good luck and uh, we'll catch you later. All right, cool. Thanks, Ian. All right, take care.